Welcome to another RD Works Learning Lab. As you can see, I've got my coat on. I've got my specially self-heating cup of coffee here. Hmm. It's about one degree C in this workshop, so I'm not going to spend too long out here today. We're going to find an excuse to get into the office very shortly. But we're going to start off in here um, because there are one or two things that I want to show you. Now, today is quite an important session. It's a summary of maybe three or four years worth of my life messing around with these machines. Trying to understand how these things work. Lenses, which I've known for many years, it doesn't perform as specified, but I never understood completely why. These things, in various forms, have been around for thousands of years. Were even used back in ancient Egypt when they tried to simulate the effect of what they saw when they dipped a stick into water. You know what I mean, when you poke a stick into water it appears to bend. Well, they found out that you could do the same sort of thing with, with glass crystals, with rock crystals. Now, what we see around us at the moment here, light, it's the same light that they had thousands of years ago. It's not changed since the beginning of the universe. Nor of these for thousands of years. So there's no reason to disbelieve what's going on with these lenses and light. Although we can't see what comes out the end of this tube, it's still light. It's part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Just because we can't see it, it just means that our eyes are not sensitive to that frequency of light. But it's still light. The same stuff that's been around for thousands of years. Or is it? And that's the fundamental question, because only about 60 years ago did scientists manage to bottle light in a different way. It was almost as impossible as bottling love, but they managed it. They didn't really change light. It's still light coming out of here, but it's got properties that make it different to this stuff that's all around us. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The strange interaction of something that's been around for thousands of years when it meets something that's only been around for 50 or 60 years. It's light. This is light transmitting. Do they work together? Sort of. But not entirely as you think. And that's what we're going to tackle today. It's quite a technical subject, but I'm going to try and make it fairly light in places because Hey, you don't have to be a scientist to understand this stuff. It's the principles that matter. You know, we're not trying to design one of these or redesign lenses. We're just trying to understand how they interact together. And that interaction is not what you think. But it's fundamental to how these machines work. And when I say these machines, I don't mean just these cheap Chinese machines. You might have the most expensive laser machine that you could ever buy but it still relies on these two pieces of technology. That piece is standard, that piece is standard. Put them together, mm, interesting outcome. So stick around to the end and I think you might be interested in what I found. It's kept my two remaining grey cells active for about the last four years. And at last I've managed to just recently piece together the whole of the problem and tie in all the loose ends. We're going to start off with square one. I'm going to introduce you first of all to my brand new laser machine. And here it is, look. No electricity, no cooling required. It's quiet. What more could I ask for? It's the perfect design. Well, obviously I jest a little bit, but uh, this has got a serious purpose because what I've got here are two laser beams. One of them is blunt and the other one is sharp. Now, I know that's not really a very good description of a laser beam, but when I show you later on what a laser beam looks like, the energy distribution, the intensity distribution of light within the laser beam itself, you'll understand what, this, what these two simulations are really for. So, to make sure that we put the same amount of energy into the laser beam every time, I've devised this very simple mechanical system here. Okay, so we're going to apply 60 watts to that blunt laser beam, like this. 
and we're going to apply the same 60 watts to that as well. I don't think it's going to take a genius to see what's happened. I mean, you could have guessed what was going to happen anyway when I applied those two laser beams to this piece of material. The blunt one has really not done much damage. The sharp one has done a lot of damage. Okay, now, this is the principle that God looked at when he designed the camel. I mean, God desperately, desperately wanted to put stiletto heels on the camel. But he looked at these results and said, look, that's silly. I know this thing is going to walk across sand and stilettos and sand do not mix. But anyway, I'm in a hurry. Let's make the Mark 1 camel and off we go. Two big lumps, long legs and big flat feet. It works. When he had spare time, he had a go at making the Mark 2. Long legs, two big lumps and stilettos. He managed to get the stilettos in this time. Now, you may not realise it, but your glass laser tube can produce a blunt beam like this or a sharp beam like this is sufficiently capable and flexible of producing both types of beam. Whereas if you've got an RF machine, it's the same CO2 laser, but it works in a completely different way and it will only ever produce a sharp beam like this. And again, I'm going to try and demonstrate that to you so that you can see the difference between laser systems and laser tubes. Now this is an RF tube. It doesn't look anything like the glass tube that you're used to seeing, but this produces an output beam from here, which is exactly the same sort of laser, CO2 laser beam that you get from a glass tube. It's just that this is a different way of producing the same result. But unfortunately, this is not using the same control system to manage the beam. Here I've got on, a special mechanism for playing with the beam itself. The laser beam on this machine is claimed to be five millimeters diameter. That's what the manufacturer says it is. And what we've got here is the beam bouncing down off three mirrors down here. This is the raw beam. There's no lens involved in this at all. We're going to give this beam a 10 second burn. Okay, I'm going to count 10 seconds and I'm going to switch the air assist on because I need to blow air here to stop it catching fire. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Well, you can see the wonderful conical shape that that produced. Yes. Now we're going to do the same 10 second burn at 20%. And I don't think I shall need the, uh, the air assist this time. Zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now look, you can see that although those beams are basically the same diameter, they're completely different shape. Now as this one on the right here started off, you saw that it was a very round-ended, blunt shape. I mean, this is still a blunt beam. 20%. It's not the same shape as the one on the left hand side. So we're able to get two different shaped beams out of this one glass tube depending on the power that we put into the beam. And that's an important thing to remember. You are changing the characteristic of the beam, the light intensity pattern within the beam by changing the power that you select to run this tube out. Right now here we are on the RF machine and this machine has only got 30 watts as opposed to 70 watts that we saw previously. So you'd expect to see it take longer to burn its way through that piece of material. Let's just see how long it actually takes. Again I'll turn on the air assist. We're going to run this at 100% power which we can do on our F zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And we'll turn the power down to 20%, the same as we did previously. Zero, 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Two things I hope you'll notice. Number one, the beam size is different this time. And two, it's not a blunt beam. It's still basically a sharp beam. And it was sharp right from the moment it started. The distribution of intensity within the beam does not change just because we change the power on this RF machine. So we've got two completely different beam characteristics from these two different machines. Now that's a very important factor because I didn't realize till recently how important the beam was to its relationship with the lens. The lens itself I've always known to be, let's just say dodgy. What we see on the box, we've got to take with a pinch of salt. I mean, this claims to be a 63.5 millimeter focal length lens. Well, first of all, it depends on how you use it, on what material you use it, what power you use it at, what speed you use it at, and what machine you use it at. How much can we believe about what's written on the box, about that lens? We've already seen the difference between a blunt beam and a sharp beam. A sharp beam does a lot more damage than a blunt beam. Here we've got no lens tube, we've just got the raw beam which is going to go down and hit that piece of acrylic. And what I've done, I've set the machine up so that it accurately delivers 200 milliseconds of power. That's the duration, the exposure time. So I press the pulse button once, and there we go, we've got 200 milliseconds of exposure time. Quick look in the end. I think this is a gallium arsenide, which means it's 63.5 millimeters focal length. And it's my favorite lens. Again, hit this with 200 milliseconds of exposure time. You certainly can see that it's penetrated all the way through with 200 milliseconds. Now, look at the straightness of that tube as well. That's a bit of a puzzle. Why can it do that? Because everything we know about laser beams says that once you've passed the focal point, the beam starts to expand. That's a problem I've been thinking about for several years now. Let's just take a look. Look, there's that mark on the surface. How much penetration has that made? The answer is none. It's just a mark on the surface. So that's the difference between exposure time with and without a lens. If you can make the beam small, concentrate the intensity down to a very, very small point, you can make it do a lot of damage. That's another very important point about the laser beam. The more intense you can make it, the faster you can do damage. That's the proof in front of your eyes there. Well, the red light tells me my coffee is going cold. So I think it's time we went back into the office in the warm with a new cup of coffee and maybe we can explore some of the things that we've seen in this session so far. Well, here we are in the warm now. Um, let's quickly start off with the actual laser tube itself that we looked at in the workshop. Now, at the ends of the laser tube here, we've got a couple of mirrors. There's one mirror here and there's one mirror here. Now, these are the most important part of the design of this laser tube, because what's happening in here with our pink beam? That pink beam is not the laser beam. That's just a beam of ionized nitrogen, a bit like lightning in a bottle that is actually being used to create the laser beam itself. But it's not a beam when it's in here. It's a load of random photons that are bouncing backwards and forwards off these two mirrors. Now, I'm not going to explain any more than that, other than the fact that these mirrors have to be perfectly, and I do mean perfectly, aligned to each other. Because anybody that's played snooker or pool knows how difficult it is to hit a ball that bounces back off of opposite cushions in exactly the same spot multiple times. It's nearly impossible. But that's what these mirrors have got to do. They've got to bounce photons from here through this very long tube off of here and back again. Now, if they get out of 
lying with each other, what will happen is there will be a tendency for them to drift away from the centre of this mirror. And what we're looking for coming out of here is something called a Gaussian distribution. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But basically what it is, it's a laser beam that's going to look like this if you could cut it through. It's very, very intense light in the centre, drifting away to absolutely nothing at the edge. If those mirrors are not perfectly in line, we start to get towards this sort of pattern, where the middle, the most intense part of the beam, is missing. And this is what a lot of B-grade tubes that are out on the market will tend to look like, certainly at low percentage power values. They may tend to fill in a little bit as you push the power up, but, but that's a completely separate issue. We're looking for the ideal laser tube to have a Gaussian distribution, which means that the intensity of light right at the centre of the beam is substantially higher than that at the edges of the beam, as we can see here. OK, now I want you to see this little um, scientific piece of equipment. It's a game almost, a piece of, you know, um, Newton's cradle type thing, um, which you can sit on your desk and play with. Look, here is a Gaussian distribution curve. It's a statistically derived graph which many people would know as a normal distribution or maybe a bell curve. For the laser community, we know this shape as a Gaussian distribution because it's the way in which light intensity is distributed within a laser beam. Now look, note this tall one here because that was the last time that this was run. But out of chaos, all of a sudden this wonderful order appears and it's a natural thing that happens in nature all the time. So look, he's cleared it down. And now we're running it again, but we're running it in slow motion. So you can look at all the chaos that's happening here as these balls jump around, making random decisions about which trough they're going to drop into. You remember it was this one last time that was tallest. So it's not absolutely repeatable. This Gaussian distribution that we're seeing here is a mathematically defined probability graph. And that's how they define the quality of a laser beam relative to that shape. It's given something called an M squared number. Um, basically, if we've got an M squared of uh, say 1.1, it's around about 90% match. To that shape and that's typically what a glass tube would be. An RF tube is about 1.2 and they get worse, a lot worse for diode lasers. Okay so look here it is again, here's our Gaussian distribution and there are mathematical relationships that happen for a curve. If I said this here is the width of the beam and this here is the light intensity at various parts of the beam. So this is intensity, the vertical axis. And power is the area under that curve. Now it doesn't matter what the power is. We could call that 60 watts. And let's just say that that's 60 watts of power. And that's the shape of the graph that's going to happen. The relative intensity for that beam width is going to be this shape. Now, if I change that shape from, say, six millimeters diameter to a two millimeter diameter beam, here's what happens. So even though these two graphs may not look the same, this is still fulfilling the same mathematical function that this one does. So we look at that same beam intensity pattern again. We can look at this graph in two ways. First of all, I will remind you of the demonstration that we had where we burnt this shape into a piece of acrylic. 25 millimeter thick acrylic, 100% power. It took 10 seconds to reach to this point here where we had a nice sharp point. But along the way at nine seconds, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and back here at say one second. Look, at one second, the shape of the beam was this shape. 
So this can either describe the evolution of a mode burn with exposure time, up to 10 seconds, say, in the case of the example that we showed, or you could say that this is a 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, all the way up to 100%. And look, at 20% power, we never managed to develop this sharp point. We put roughly 10 seconds. I know it caught fire and we had eight seconds, but it would have still been this sort of shape after eight seconds with 20% power. The shape of the beam depends on the power that you put into the beam. This would be a 10% shape, and this would be a 20% shape, and this would be a 30% shape, etc., etc. So we normally do cutting with a sharp beam, not what I call a blunt beam. And as I said, this is called a mode burn because we're checking that we've got mode TEM00, a Gaussian distribution. If we've got the hole in the middle, that won't come out anything like this. Right, well, we've nearly finished with Gaussian curves in terms of trying to get you to understand what a Gaussian distribution is. And here we've got three of those Gaussian distributions, which I've used the colours to illustrate the relative height of the intensities as we get out towards the edge of the beam. So here we've got our six millimetre beam with 60 watts of power within this area here. And you can see the same graph here. But this time what I've done, I've used the same six millimetre beam, but I have now increased the power to three times the power. So instead of a 60 watt beam, this is now a 180 watt beam. And look, we've got three times the intensity because we've increased the power by a factor of three. There's the 60 watts, there's the 180 watts. If we take this same graph here and reduce it to two millimeters diameter, here's what happens, look. But we've got exactly the same intensity here as what we had when we put three times the power into the beam. Look at the closeness of these rays here, whereas here the rays are much more spread out. Okay, now this is the whole point of me using these colours on these graphs. This will become very important later on, the various intensities within the Gaussian distribution. And I hope you can remember what I told you when we were out in the workshop. The greater the intensity, the faster we can do damage. This ray here can do exactly the same amount of damage as this ray here. And it can do it three times faster than this ray here. Well, let's move on to lenses now, shall we? I mean, I don't think there's any doubt here that we are talking about laser lenses, which is what I've requested in my Google search. Um, but these are typical lenses, which when we start looking at them closely, they're specifically for CO2 laser machines by a very large laser company. So surely these guys know what they're talking about. The rays come down here to a focal point and then they expand out. These are typical pictures that you see everywhere about how a lens works. And to be honest, there's nothing wrong with any of this information. It is exactly how a lens works. If you wanted to put it in a telescope or a microscope or a camera or a projector, this is how the rays would come in. Look, you put an image in here, it would come down to nothing and then it would expand out to an image this side. You expect to get out what you put in. That's exactly what the idea of a lens is for imaging. But we're not building a telescope. We're not running a microscope. We're trying to concentrate intensity through this lens. And I can assure you that what goes in does not come out. First of all, there is no such thing as a, a fixed focal length. The focal length changes depending on the material that you use, the speed that you use, the power that you use, and the way that you use the lens. So there's all sorts of variables that affect the focal distance itself, and maybe as much as two millimetres. I mean, you know, you haven't got plus or minus five millimetres on here. You start moving out by two millimetres, or maybe even a millimetre, and you will start losing the sharpness that you get at a focal point. Now, it's not the focal point, it's just a focal point, but it's a focal point of intensity, not an optical focal point. And there's a big difference between these two, which we will come on to shortly. 
Let's take a look here. We've got a two and a half inch lens here. Look what happens to that two and a half inch lens below the focal point. Let's go and have a look at a two and a half inch lens working, should we? And we'll just stop it there so that you can see what we've done. First of all, this is a two and a half inch lens. It's set roughly a millimeter off the surface of the material there. It's got air assist blowing down through there, but look at the shape of the cut that it's producing. It's parallel and this is 26 millimeters thick material. Now I'm only using that 60 or 70 watt machine that we were on earlier. And we were cutting this at three millimeters a second hardwood. How is this possible when all the diagrams are showing us that the beam is diverging and losing its energy as soon as it goes below the focal point? Now look, this must be the focal point because that width there at the top is virtually the same as it is here all the way down. It's a parallel cut. And that was my fundamental problem. Not only were lenses not living up to the specifications that they claimed, they did some weird things as well, which could not be predicted from any of those drawings of lens rays that you see. So something weird was going on here, which I needed to understand. Nobody else seemed to bother because, hey, you buy a lens, you buy a laser beam, you put them together, and here's how it performs. It does the job. There's got to be some other mechanism that's going on that's not actually obeying the normal laws of lens theory. Now, I've spent hundreds of hours running cutting tests on various materials with my collection of lenses. I've taken samples of each one of the tests and looked at the cut, the size of the cut, to see if I could work out any sort of pattern to the shape that would allow me to work out exactly how a lens was able to produce this fantastic parallel cut. Then I did another set of comparisons, looking at the way in which lenses cut, the way in which the dot size, the so-called spot size, changes, which starts off at half of nothing and finishes up at this size. Although I've set this to what I thought was the focal point, it can't be. And here we've got two different sets of lines that I've drawn, one at 10% power, and they're running at something like about 20 millimetres a second, 20 millimetres a second, 20% power. Look, just because I've changed the power, look what's happened to the line thickness. They were both set to the same focal point. The point I'm making here, there is no focal point. Focal point is something which changes with speed, with power, with material, with lens shape, with lens orientation. That's what this test was all about. Again, trying to see if I could find out the magic formula that allowed this lens to cut that deep parallel cut. One of the interesting tests that I carried out was with the lens on the focal point, I was able to run different durations of time. So two, four, six, eight, 10 milliseconds, 12, 14, 16, 18 milliseconds, for this lens, for example, this is a four inch lens. So look at the amount of penetration we get for two milliseconds, right? And let's just compare that to one, two others. So look, here we've got a 38.1 zinc celluloid CVD, which is a, a, a pretty good quality American lens. Um, it's a meniscus lens. It's got a curvature on the bottom as well as rather than a flat. Now this has the effect of improving the focal point and here we are, look, we've got a super focal point here and well, two milliseconds is not making any mark at all. Four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, maybe 20 milliseconds to reach four millimeters deep. And that's the lens used the supposedly correct way. That's the way in which the lens is designed. But I'm sure those that watch this know that I'm a bit of a rebel. And I'm not prepared to accept the fact that that's the right way. Because look, here's the same lens the wrong way with the meniscus side upwards. Look at the penetration. We've already got two millimeters of penetration at two milliseconds. Four, six, eight, maybe 10 milliseconds this time to get to four millimeters deep. 
this way round the lens seems to be cutting twice as fast as it does the right way round. I mean you can argue as much as you like as to whether I'm using the lens the right or the wrong way round. At the end of the day all I want is the most efficient way to use the lens. This is not the most efficient way to use a lens if you are putting it into a telescope but it seems to be the most efficient way for our telescope. Okay let's have a quick word about lenses. Now we're very limited in the choice of lenses that we can use for our machine. We've got this one which is called a meniscus lens and this one which you all probably know about which is the Plano convex lens. Now this Plano convex lens I've known for a long time that it's not a perfect lens. It doesn't focus down to a single focal point. If we look here you can see that these rays from the outside are converging at a different point to those that are coming through the central part of the lens. Now this is a phenomenon called aberration which to be honest I haven't really paid much attention to. Uh, it's just one of those things you know we use a lens and it does what we expect it to do more or less and we don't worry about all this small detail here. This aberration can be corrected almost. When we look at the meniscus lens I say nearly corrected there's still a little bit of error here maybe 95% corrected but we've actually got a pretty good focal point we ought to say this is fantastic because look it's concentrated all the energy down to a very 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 small spot so we've got 60 watts here and 60 watts here compressed into that very small spot remember the camel with the stilettos well this is the stilettos now as I said to you earlier I've been hunting for the reason why I can cut with a lens this must be the reason why I can cut with a lens because it's got a super focal point this one is absolute rubbish so this aberration seems to be the worst thing we can have in a lens for our machine. Our telescope <coughs> is going to be not much good if we stick one of these in it. Now it was just a few months ago that I was trawling through the internet looking for something else completely when I just happened to come across this aberrations fundamentals of. It was a set of lecture notes given by this um, eminent professor in the university from the University of Athens and I sat down and looked at it. One of the things that's emphasized in these lecture notes is that all spherical geometry lenses contain this error, this thing that we see here which is a fuzzy focus, spherical aberration. You can't get away from it. The only way that you can correct it is by either using a meniscus lens or combinations of lenses to decrease the effect of aberration. All very interesting because for instance this one here is the lens design that I use for my compound lens. In normal light terms it's not an absolute disaster to have a little bit of spherical aberration because look it's a little bit fuzzy this picture but if you can remove the spherical aberration completely the picture becomes clear. But I mentioned just a few minutes ago we're not trying to transmit images with our lenses we're trying to transmit light intensity, power, energy. We don't care how the photons are muddled up they don't have to come out the same as they go in. Here we've got the lens that we've just looked at it's our Plano convex lens. So what we've got here is a distance h which is the distance that a ray happens to be away from the axis of the lens itself. And if we take a look at various H dimensions here, he's done a calculation for where those rays will focus. There is no focal point as such, but there's a range of focal points depending on how far the ray is from the lens axis. And that defines the amount of spherical aberration that we've got into the lens. It's roughly five millimeters in this case. We're always told that we must use a lens this way round. It's designed to deal with two refractions. We've got one refraction here as it enters our lens material and it bends the ray and then we've got a further refraction here as it exits the lens and goes back into air we've got a further bending and it is this double bending that's causing this change of focal point because if we take a look here we've got an angle that, that ray is hitting that surface and if we look at these you'll see that the angle 
where the ray is hitting the surface is at a different angle to this one. This one's steep, this one's shallow, and it's getting shallower and shallower to the point where it's nothing there. It's parallel with this face. Any ray that happens to be on that axis will pass right through that lens, right through here. It'll disappear right out the other side onto infinity. It's bad enough having our aberration with the lens this way round. What happens if I'm a little bit of a naughty boy and I turn the lens over and I try using it the wrong way round? Oh my goodness me, look what happens now. We've got these rays that are coming in, but of course any ray that hits the surface at 90 degrees will just pass into the material with zero refraction. So there'll be no bending on these rays as they enter that material. So the only bending that will take place of that ray will be as it exits this surface here. So it hits this surface at an angle, and of course it's a different angle for this one, or this one. So all the refraction is taking place on just one surface alone, and that causes, hey, a pretty serious amount of aberration. The picture will be totally muddled and confused, because look, here's our dimensions away from the lens axis, and this time, for the same lens, we've got a range of 24, to 48 millimeters. That's a 24 millimeter aberration. I mean, that's horrendous. These numbers are just example numbers that have been calculated for this particular lens. These are not exactly our lenses. A 25 millimeter spherical radius lens? Well, the closest we can get to that with our, uh, with a one inch lens is around about 35 or 36 millimeters. So surely ours are not gonna be anywhere near as bad as this. Now I'm sure most of you will understand what a light bulb moment is. And all I can say is, I would like to thank these two professors here for providing me with this drawing diagram because all of a sudden, this was a light bulb moment. I could almost instantly see how lenses cut from this diagram. But I just said to you, it's the most rubbish thing in the world. We shouldn't be putting this anywhere near our machine. But, hang on, there's some bits and pieces of information that I need to feed you with because, remember, these guys are optical experts. They are passing light images through lenses. This is standard lens theory. We've got light rays which are passing through lenses, just like this. Those rays are exactly the same rays as normal light rays, with one minor exception. All those rays are of the same intensity. We do not have the same intensity rays in our light beam. Let me try and explain to you how I immediately saw something different in this picture. You'll recall just a few minutes ago I showed you these rainbow rays inside the Gaussian distribution. Well this gives you an idea of what's actually going on when these rays pass through the focal point or the focal area, the focal zone of this lens. But remember, if I make this beam smaller, I've not lost any power, but as I make the beam smaller, what's going to happen is this intensity is going to get greater and greater and greater. But look what we're doing here. We're making the beam smaller and smaller and smaller. We're, we're squashing 60 watts into a smaller and smaller beam size. So the intensity is going to go up by some significant amount. But hang on, we're going to increase the intensity of these pink rays, which are virtually nothing. And they're still going to be virtually nothing. You know, you take 0% and multiply it by 1000, it's still a 0%. So these rays at the outside, even though they're being focused down to a point, their intensity at that point is still pretty close to zero. So they're not having much effect on the damage capability of this beam with this lens. The things that are really being focused are these probably yellow, orange through to yellow. This zone here is the thing that's probably going to be doing the most damage. And look, these are truly being concentrated down into some very, very significant high intensity at this point here. Let me strip away some of the rubbish. So we've removed 
useless rays from the outside just to save the confusion and we can see a little bit clearer about what's happening down here. Yeah we have got a better focal point but it's still over a zone here. Look the red focal point is probably here somewhere and the blue focal point is here somewhere. You might think that the nominal focal point was there. Why don't we just go and have a little bit of a closer look at that zone there. The outer orange rays here are focusing at this point and the more central red rays are focusing down here somewhere. They're still not reached the focus. But those rays are the most intense rays of the whole beam and they still haven't reached a focus. There is a nominal focus here somewhere and I don't know where it is. I'm guessing when I thought it might be at A because look we've got this focus here but maybe it's here. I, I, I can't guess because I do not have the mental capability of analysing the different intensities of all these beams and drawing a graph of the intensity pattern at that point. But if you fire the laser beam at a material surface you can find that point because that's what we find when we look for the focus. We're not looking for the optical focus, we're looking for the focus of maximum damage in the smallest area. Now I want to drag you back to the pictures that we saw in the workshop. Those mode burns. The mode burns had a point but that point was nothing to do with focus. That point was just because it was the point of high intensity at the centre of the beam that was burning forward faster than the lower intensity outer part of the beam. There wasn't any lens involved with those mode burn tests. Well we've moved into my CAD program now because I need to be a little bit interactive with some of the stuff that I'm going to describe to you now. We set the focus onto the surface of this piece of fictitious material. The focus was determined by the method that I've just shown you, the thinnest line method is a white line which represents the point where the red maximum intensity rays reach a focal point. And here we've re just used a nominal position here where those rays have gone beyond their focal point and are diverging. Now there are several concepts that you've got to get to grips with. Intensity is the thing that does the damage to your material. The higher the intensity, the faster it shakes the molecules, the quicker those molecules get destroyed and we can actually then destroy molecule by molecule and work our way through this material. This is a gradual erosion process but it happens very fast because the intensity of this is high and the damage rate is very rapid. First of all we can see that these rays are nothing like the rays that they started off at. We haven't got a Gaussian profile here so we won't have a Gaussian distribution shape that comes out here. The moment you turn the laser beam on it produces if you like light on the surface of this material. Not down here but just on the surface of the material. Now depending on the intensity of that light and how long we keep that light in place would depend on the amount of damage that we do in this material. Exposure time as one aspect of this. The sensitivity or damage threshold of this material is another. You can get materials that if you like damage easily and materials that take a lot of effort to damage. Acrylic is a material that takes a lot of effort to damage. You can cut wood twice as fast as you can cut acrylic. So here are two burn tests that I carried out. One of them was with the lens flat side down and then I did the same thing with the flat side up. But with the flat side down you'll notice that we've got just what I described here. A pretty flat pancake burn 45 millimetres. So we're seven millimetres above the focal point. We've pulled the focus well away from the work. And then as we bring the focus in closer to the work the beam starts getting smaller in diameter and look you can see the shrinking beam diameter but in addition to that the power in the beam, the intensity in the beam goes up and we start getting a deeper and deeper burn. They've all got the same power, they've all got the same exposure time of two milliseconds. 70 watts, two milliseconds. 70 watts, two milliseconds. The only difference between this and this is the intensity in the beam 
because we have moved back along the beam. This is not the same as a cut. We're basically sampling the beam at different points along its traverse back towards the focal point. This 38 mil is supposed to be the optical focal point, but in reality, it looks as though 37 millimeters is the best intensity focal point. This is a little bit unexpected because this is a very sensitive card, very thin, soft card. There's just a hint here, look around the outside when the intensity is lower around the outside, that I would get more of this sort of scorching effect around the outside. And I would get more scorching around the outside of these. There's still enough intensity here to evaporate the cellulose. It hasn't scorched the cellulose. Okay, now we have the luxury here of being able to watch a burn taking place in 20 millisecond intervals. All we see is that sharp, deep cut caused by the intensity profile at the surface where the central piece of energy is very, very high. Now we'll move on another 20 milliseconds. We've still got a very, very long, thin beam. But if we take a look just up here where the mouth is, you'll see that it's starting to develop a little bit of a cone up here. Now we go on a little bit and look, this piece is now thicker than what it was initially. It looked like this, a very thin beam, but it's now getting a little bit thicker. Now we can take a look here and we can see the, see the, the footprint at the top is very large in relation to this bore. So we've got damage that's taking place around the outside of our beam core, but it's not having a major effect at the moment because we haven't given it enough exposure time to do any damage. So there we go. We're pushing on downwards, but you'll notice at the top here where I'm pointing out with my pencil, we're starting to develop a bit of a cone at the top there because time is now beginning to elapse. Look how that cone is forming at the top there. Can you see how we're generating a trumpet shape now? There are all sorts of other things going on in there as well. But what I really want to show you is that this bit at the top here is actually now has enough exposure time to allow certain other parts of the beam to have an effect. And here's the start of the second burn that I did. Now, as you can see, this burn starts off and is nothing like the finished article. This is our focal point on the surface. And let's take a look at see what's happening. Look, we've got the red beam, which dominates virtually the whole of this area. So we're going to have quite a lot of burning taking place here. But of course, remember, this, these red rays are only nominal lines. They get more intense and more intense as I get towards this red center line. So the rays at this red center line will be able to do much more damage than those red rays at the outside. But of course, these red rays as well are also still converging. So as they converge, they get more intense. As you can see, these red rays are the most powerful rays and they're likely to burn their way through, producing a what looks like a fairly parallel hole through this piece of material. This is the hole on the surface just here. Light travels in straight lines. And so, you know, those, those rays will enter that hole at a very acute angle, but will then still imp impact the side walls of the tube, lose their energy and evaporate material. Look, you can see these developed beams here have got what I call ballooning. Now this spike here started off exactly like all the others, a very, very thin spike. But as it has grown, look, you can still see the spiky point here, but what's happening is other rays are coming in and joining in the party and they're starting to erode the sidewall because they're not traveling downwards, they're traveling slightly off angle and they're impacting the sidewall and evaporating the sidewall. You can see how quickly it's developing. As I keep stressing to you, remember, there is no single focal point that's responsible for this cutting action. The red rays, the green rays, the orange rays have each got their own mode burn. It just so happens that the red rays will actually produce a much greater and faster mode burn than all the other rays. So what I've been showing you so far is basically the path of the rays as they leave the lens, pass through a series of focal points and 
the mechanism by which a cut can occur. But of course, once it's below the focal point, what I've been showing you are very, very long duration burns, 330 milliseconds, a third of a second. Now, a third of a second is a long time in laser terms. What I want to do is here is just very quickly explain to you what's really going to happen. Everything that I've shown you is true, but it's not cutting. We're only using a very small part of that mechanism that I've been describing to you to produce a cut. This is a simulation of a cut based on a number of if you like holes that I'm going to drill through the material. Now let's just assume that the kerf width, the diameter of this circle, the diameter of the beam, the diameter of the hole that I'm going to drill is 0.15 of a millimetre. Now to produce a millimetre of cut I need about 15 holes. Let's just assume that a typical cutting speed is around about 15 millimetres a second. Means that what I'm really going to do, I'm going to produce 15 holes in one second, I'm going to move 15 of these millimetres, 225 holes per second. A thousand divided by 225, let's not get too fussy about this, it's approximately a thousand divided by 200, which is about five milliseconds for every one of those holes. So, Whereas I've been talking about 300, 330 milliseconds for those developed whole shapes, cutting doesn't take anywhere near that. So we've got to take a look what happens in around about five milliseconds, because that's when a cut takes place. What about the depth of the cut? The depth of the cut will be determined by the power and the lens that you use. Let me give you some examples of exactly what I mean. Now here we've got two tests which I've done back to back. We've got one test here and one test here. Now they would normally be both this way up so that you can see the penetration going downwards. Okay, but for comparison I've taken these two test blocks and put them back to back so you can compare easily the difference between the orientation of this 38.1 millimeter lens that I've been using throughout this demonstration. Now, here's the lens the wrong way up. Here's the lens the right way up. Now, what we've got here is a penetration of two milliseconds, four milliseconds, six, eight, 10, all the way up to 30 milliseconds. Now, what we've just said is that really what we're looking at is somewhere between four, six, depending on how fast you go, maybe even as fast as eight milliseconds. But what we're really talking about is what happens in these first three tests typically. So look, you can see the beam never gets a chance to develop any of this funny shape. We're only ever using what I like to call the red spike, that high intensity right at the centre of the beam that's being focused down to a very, very narrow high intensity beam. This is a spike into acrylic. The acrylic cuts roughly half the speed of most woods. We can see that in two milliseconds, used the right way up, this beam has hardly had any penetration at all. And yet you would think that with a one and a half inch lens, because it is a very sharp lens, producing a very narrow beam that it would penetrate very quickly. Well, I think you'll see that it doesn't because look, it takes two, four, six milliseconds to reach two millimeters deep, which is what these lines are, engraved lines on the background are. Whereas when we turn the lens over the wrong way with the flat side up, look, two, four, in six milliseconds, we've gone 50, 60, 70% more than when we had it the right way up. Now, you remember we spoke earlier about how good a meniscus lens is at focusing the energy. And therefore on the flip side, when you take a meniscus lens and put the rays through it the wrong way, the aberration is gonna be horrendous. Technically, most people would say, that is going to be absolutely trash for cutting. Here we are again. Use the right way round. At two milliseconds, we've got zero penetration. 
We've almost got nothing in the way of a penetration at four milliseconds, let alone six milliseconds. Look, in this case, to get to two millimeters, it's gonna take two, four, six, eight, 10, 12 milliseconds, maybe 14 milliseconds. This one is performing virtually the same as the Plano convex lens. So this is all using 70 watts. Look at it, it's absolutely amazing, the difference. I mean, it shows you how much effect aberration has on cutting. You need aberration for cutting. You don't need aberration for engraving. This, used this way round, as a great engraving lens because it produces a very small focal spot. It just stops roughly at the focal point. You can cut with this, but not very efficiently. Now here we see a 63.5 zinc selenide Plano convex lens, two and a half inch Plano convex lens. Used the right way round, well, there's not a great deal of difference between them, certainly not up to our two, four, six milliseconds. They perform roughly the same either way round with that lens. What about when we change it to a meniscus lens? Hmm, look at it now, rubbish. Hmm, so this one, two, four, six, again, it gets almost to three millimeters whereas this makes it to barely two millimeters right so let's just take a look at the meniscus version of what we've just seen again look the right way round is performing like this the wrong way round we've got a little bit of a thicker beam here but it's penetrating very quickly and let's look at what the plano convex version of a, a gallium arsenide lens does the right way round is a lot worse than the wrong way round. This is the lens that I use all the time in my machine. So for my 26 millimeter cutting that I showed you earlier, I was running at three millimeters a second. Based on my 15 holes per millimeter, three millimeters a second is roughly 45, let's just say 50 holes per second. Well, 50 holes per second, 50 into a thousand, so that's 20 milliseconds two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. And here it is. Look, it's still a nice straight hole at 20 milliseconds. But of course, I wasn't using 20 milliseconds into acrylic. I was using 20 milliseconds into wood. So this is two, four, six, eight. So into wood, it would typically be, on the basis of what you see here, 16 millimeters deep. I was stretching it to 26 millimeters deep. Can you see the way now in which these very simple tests give you an idea of the difference between the performance of lenses? The, the performance of this lens on my machine is because of the shape and the intensity of my beam. Your beam might not be the same as my beam, and in which case your results will be different to these. There is no predictable set of results from a lens. The lens is only working with the beam that you put in. Rubbish in, rubbish out. Here we've got this magical lens that I use all the time, and it's a Plano convex lens. I wonder whether I would actually get some of these amazing results by using a meniscus version. Look, it's rubbish, rubbish, rubbish all the way. It seems to make no difference at all on my machine if I use a 63.5 gallium arsenide meniscus lens. And here we've got a four inch lens, Plano convex. And in this case, it looks as though the right way round is actually performing better than the wrong way round. It looks as though the meniscus version is still better upside down than the correct way. Now, subsequent to all the work that I've been doing on this video, I happen to come across this particular piece of amazing software. First of all, you have to load this player into it, it's like an app. And then we've got this simulation of spherical aberration. Now in this software, we can set the lens properties. We can either have a biconvex, which is what we've got here, which is not what we ever use in our machine, but we can choose Plano convex one way or Plano convex the other way. So we've got a choice of two lenses that we can test and we've got beam properties, both parallel and divergent. Well, we're only gonna have parallel. So I'm gonna set this up for a typical 25 millimeter focal length lens. I've chosen Plano convex up there 
you can't really see it in here but close up I can tell you that this is the lens the correct way round flat side towards the work but if I was to click here with my cursor a little bit rectangle and if I put that black rectangle just there at the focal point I get a magnified focal point down in this bottom view now I can change the magnification of this with this slider here but it makes sense to have it fully magnified so that you can see what's going on in the focal area let's put it into the center of the screen with these arrow keys and I think you can see from the moiré pattern between these lines that what comes in is not the same as what comes out I can't get in any closer than that what I can do is reduce the number of rays to remove some of the confusion so let's reduce the rays from 10 down to say six or something like that okay now you can clearly see the aberration effect the different focal points for different parts of the ray pattern I'm not imagining it when I did my simulations my rainbow simulations here we've got a technically correct simulation for a lens which shows exactly the aberration that I've been describing to you this is the good way remember let's swap it over to the wrong way okay I think the point is made the aberration the wrong way round is substantially worse than the aberration the correct way round I can leave you to play with this simulation to put all sorts of other size lenses in it for yourself in the description below I will add the player and the piece of software that goes with it to produce this simulation and I will also add a PDF copy of a report that goes along with this video so thanks for your time and your patience and uh, I'll catch up with you in the next session